Council number 45, the people of the state of New York versus Jose Valentin. Council. Good afternoon, Your Honors, and may it please the court. Kate Mollison, Office of the Appellate Defender, on behalf of Jose Valentin. I'd like to reserve two minutes for rebuttal. Two minutes? Two minutes, yes. Two minutes. Your Honors, is it, if this was a drug sale, it was the friendliest, most leisurely drug sale you could imagine. Police watched Mr. Valentin and a friend as they walked and talked together, strolling through Mr. Valentin's neighborhood for is more really, than- Is there any dispute really as to whether uh, he was entitled to the agency defense instruction? No, not, not in our understanding, no. The prosecution attempts to suggest that, but the, there is no question that the judge found that he was, that it was required to, the court was required to um, instruct on this charge, and, and Mr. Valentin, frankly, was entitled to it because the evidence screamed agency. So why is this different from any, Mal, any other type of Molino issue where um, intent becomes an, a, a, a material question in, in the case? Well, this is different because the court has always construed agency cases different. Um, differently. In, in agency cases, the court allows Molino evidence to come in when the defendant has affirmatively tendered his innocence. In this case, Mr. Valentin made no case as to agency. What happened was the prosecution's own case made out agency. Did, does that mean that he didn't cross-examine witnesses or in opening say, I'm, I'm going to possibly tendered agency defense here? He did not. I mean, he did, he did cross-examine witnesses, but not as to furthering the agency defense. Um, the appellate division was very clear in its finding. It made a factual finding that, Mr. Val that all of the evidence that supported agency was elicited by the people. Um, on opening, this was, agency was not at all the defense that was being pursued. What the defense counsel was pursuing on opening was an idea that no sale occurred. He called this the Rashomon effect. Um, well, but didn't, didn't defense counsel make some statements during summation and, and, um, and, and ask some questions which really led into the agency defense? Well, frankly, the questions that were asked on cr cross-examination that the prosecution argues ended up supporting the agency or were at least consistent with the agency theory were questions that were so basic for example, how long were the, were the defendant and his friend together? That if we were to say those questions open the door, we're essentially saying that a defendant who has prior convictions. But it's um, not just a matter of opening the door. He did affirmatively ask for that jury instruction. It's not like somebody's forcing it on him, you know, the, the people through their evidence and, and were saying, well, you must do this. The defendant chose to assert this defense. Well, what happened here is, I mean, the defendant essentially sat back, Mr. Valentin sat back and waited to see what evidence unfolded before him. And when the prosecution's evidence couldn't withstand an agency interpretation, when that became clear on the face of the prosecution's case in chief, Mr. Valentin was perfectly entitled to ask for that charge. And sure, in this case, Mr. Valentin did ask for that charge, but it could have been the court, sua sponte, who had looked at that evidence and said, look, what we have here is obviously agency. And it doesn't make sense that because the prosecution has put on an agency case, it can then bootstrap in evidence that we know to be the most prejudicial evidence, essentially, in a criminal case, that is evidence of Mr. Valentin's well, prior Doesn't it crimes. matter that the defendant has no burden of proof on a defense? So why isn't it enough in this case that he well, it, because the pro it's, it's exactly, that's exactly the point. It's the prosecution's burden of proof to meet um, the reasonable doubt standard. And if the prosecution's own evidence reveals that, in fact, it's pretty reasonable here that Mr. Valentin was not acting as a seller, but was acting as a buyer, then he, the prosecution shouldn't be allowed to bolster what is otherwise a weak case with evidence that is so prejudicial that in every other case, we would keep it out. Um, and I think it's, it's worth emphasizing how prejudicial this evidence is, how prejudicial well, what, uh, Molino the evidence defense is. defense counsel at one point, when, he, when the judge, as I recall, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, when the judge says there will be, uh, the jury will hear about one of his prior sales, the defense counsel at that point withdraws the request? I think that that's, right. I mean. But the, the, the judge was not then going to give the instruction regardless, correct? In this case, no, but there's no reason why a judge couldn't look at the evidence presented by the prosecution. Even if the defendant doesn't want it and says, I don't want that instruction at all? Exactly, over the defendant's objection. And, and I think that shows the kind of unfairness here. I mean, the fact but, that the prosecution. But that's not what happened here. That's not what happened here, certainly. But it's, it's very clear. And, and, and perhaps that might be a different case, but, but certainly in this case, 
but in, in both instances, you have a case where the defendant has done nothing to advance the theory, and we're looking entirely at the prosecution's own case in chief. Well, it doesn't asking for the um, instruction advance the theory. Isn't, isn't that telling the, the, the jury that you have to determine whether there really was intent to sell here? I don't think that asking for the charge is that trigger. I mean, we can look to this court's well, recent the, the, case The problem I have, though, is, is by asking for the charge, you're in essence, after the people have closed now, you've asked for the charge, um, you're adding an additional element that the people have to prove, and the additional mens rea element at this particular point. And so that's one that their case in chief wouldn't have been designed to address, and the only reason the element was added, it was in response to your request a charge. So address that point. Sure. Okay. This court's precedent has been very clear from 1978 when the agency defense was first articulated by this mm -hmm. court that agency does not add an additional element. Mm -hmm. What agency does is it negates the element of sale. It says this person before us was not in the role of a seller. He was acting as a buyer. And it's not that he was acting as a seller but intending to profit or not intending to profit. It's so, not an additional so you're, element. So you're saying that you don't argues. have to then address the mens rea element at all? No. I mean, this uh, is the same burden the prosecution has in every, in every drug sale case, which is to prove that the defendant was but a drug in, seller. In most drug cases, intent is inferred from the act itself. And, and by asking for an agency charge, aren't you saying you can't improve that, you can't um, infer that intent here because of these circumstances? Well, I think the fact that the... The, the, the people didn't say that you can't infer intent. They put the proof forward and, and the defendant said, I think this proof shows something else. And, and, and now the people have the burden of showing that it doesn't show that something else. The charge merely allows the jury to properly evaluate the evidence before it. Um, it doesn't change the elements of the crime or what the jury um, needs to needs to know in order to convict on the or does change what so needs to know. So you're saying, in order to counsel, on the crime. that this jury hearing the evidence without a request by defendant for an agency defense could have decided not to convict for a drug sale because they thought that this was uh, you know, just a, a friendly kind of transaction that had nothing to do with an intent to sell drugs. I think that the jury needed, this, needed the charge in order to convict because the charge made it clear that Mr. Valentin was not acting as a seller. But I'd just like to make one final point since I realize my light is on. Um, this court was very clear in a recent case, People versus Gonzalez, um, that when a defendant asks for a charge, jury charge, based entirely on the prosecution's case in chief, the defendant has not put on a, well, put that, on a defense that case, such the though, prosecution. That case, though, involved a different statute, right? That the statute required the defendant to put, ask or to give notice that if, if the defendant were, were seeking an EED defense, that the defendant had to give notice to the people, and that didn't happen in that case. That case did involve a question of statutory interpretation, but it also answered essentially the same dispositive question here, which is that when um, a defendant has relied entirely on the prosecution's case in order to ask for a charge, the defendant has not put on a case, has not advanced any evidence that the prosecution therefore has a right to rebut. Essentially, because the defendant hasn't put anything forward, the prosecution does not have the right to rebut itself. And that was a, the, the clear holding of Gonzalez. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Counsel? Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the Court. Brian Pulliat on behalf of the people. Your Honors, when a defendant requests and secures an agency charge, he's undoubtedly presenting an agency defense because the charge instructs the jury that the people have to disprove that defense. It instructs the jury that the people have to prove not only that the defendant sold drugs to the buyer under the penal law definition of that term, but also that in doing so, he had some profit motive. I think that's why this court, every court of, of the appellate division, and the CJI itself states that when an agency uh, defense is considered, the jury should consider a defendant's prior drug selling crimes subject to the court's balancing of their probative versus prejudicial impact at trial. Uh, now, while it is our position that the charge is enough to show that a defendant's presenting an agency defense, defense counsel here did more 
prior to opening statements, he even said to the court, Your Honor, I think there's a view of evidence that agency exists here. So we know, uh, contrary to the defense point of view, that he didn't just sit back and wait. He, this was at the forefront of his mind throughout trial. Is there anything in the cross-examination that goes to the agency defense? Yes, Your Honor. As a matter of fact, there were several uh, facts elicited during cross-examination that were used in summation to present the defense. I think most importantly, the fact that defendant and the buyer were together for a long period of time. And that's what defense counsel then used to say that uh, they, were, they were buddies, they were friends. Um, also elicited was the fact that defendant only had $8 on his person when he was stopped, which wasn't enough to cover the cost of the drugs. Uh, the fact that um, defendant wasn't a known drug dealer. Defense counsel asked the officer, did you know you knew the players in the neighborhood? And he said yes. Um, and then they asked if they knew of defendant as a drug dealer. The officer said no. And then um, also the fact that defendant didn't have any additional drugs on his person also elicited during cross-examination. Counsel, why isn't this case like, more like Gonzalez than it is um, the other cases? Judge Abdusalam, I, I think, I know you authored it, I think you hit the nail on the head. One of the first lines in uh, Gonzalez, you stated, uh, the issue here is whether CPL 25010 applies. This case has nothing to do with CPL 25010. That, that is, is a statute that involves the people's introduction of certain type of psychiatric examinations. And our introduction of those examinations is triggered by defense counsel's introduction of similar examinations. But if the people have to prove intent to sell in any case, whether or not there's a, a notice beforehand that certain evidence is going to be um, introduced, doesn't the principle still apply that if you have intent, um, if the people have to prove intent, that there's nothing to rebut? No, Your Honor, I, I don't think so. And this is where I, I think I disagree with defense counsel. It's not the same burden that the people have before and after an agency charge or an agency defense. As this court even uh, noted in Lam Lak Chong in some of the 1978 cases, when an agency defense isn't presented, the people only have to prove the penal law definition of sell, which is to give, exchange, or dispose of. Thus, as the court said in Lam Lak Chong, any handing off of drugs can constitute a sale. Once the agency defense is raised and presented, we now has to have to disprove that the defendant acted as an agent, essentially, as this court said in Roche, meaning we have to prove that there was some type of profit motive. So it's that, it's that uh, intent to profit or profit motive, however you want to you phrase it or color it, that's different once the charge is given. And, and since it's an ordinary defense, as I think this court already pointed out, it's our burden to prove it once it's raised, and thus and it Chong, triggers. The, the defendant testified, right? Does that matter? Excuse me, Your Honor? As long as the defendant testified, does that matter? I don't think that matters, Your Honor, because again, once the defense is raised, it's an ordinary defense, we have the burden of disproving. It hinges on whether or not we have to actually prove this new additional thing, not on what evidence the defendant did or didn't present in furtherance of that defense. And of course, as we noted in our brief, we have cases from, from every department of the appellate division where the defendant either didn't testify or the people were allowed to introduce the mono evidence on their direct case, showing that it's not the evidence that is or isn't presented, but again, whether the defense is presented. And I think the charge absolutely shows. So, so most of the cases, though, involve the introduction of Molyneux in the direct case, don't they? Not, not in rebuttal. Correct, Your Honor. Here it was introduced in the direct case as well. Oh, the defendant asked the for the charge case, uh, before we arrested. So the Molyneux evidence, in essence, would generally cause the defendant uh, to forego the agency defense um, in most circumstances that I've seen. But what difference does it make, make that in this instance, the agency defense is purely introduced by the weaknesses in your case, not in anything, any case that they made at all? Your Honor, I don't think our case can be considered weak, and I think that's an important point well, here. Well, it's weak enough so that they get the agency charge. But I think this goes back to, to what I was discussing before. Before the agency charge and the defense, mm -hmm. again, all we have to prove is that defendant gave drugs to the buyer. So our case before the charge and defense was presented was very strong because we had an undercover officer who saw the buyer give money to the defendant, saw a defendant cross the street, come back, give two items to the buyer. The buyer was stopped, and those two items were in the same pocket he placed them in, two glass scenes of heroin. So our case was very strong at that point. Now, the agency defense is presented. We have to prove something more. We have to prove this profit motive. And again, our case can only be considered weak at that point if we're barred from introducing this very probative evidence of defendant's intent to profit. If I may just address one more thing, um, I believe uh, defense counsel noted that there, this may be a problem in some other case where the court gives an instruction over the defense's objection. 
I think in those cases, at least in the first department, there's precedent that defendant would then have a claim on appeal that he was being forced into a certain defense or to accept a certain charge. So I don't think that's really a concern that, that applies here. People v. Maria is the first department case. Could, could, could the court decide that the prior convictions are just too prejudicial in this case? Would that have put the people in a position where they could not have made their case? Would that have been error? Well, Your Honor, the court could absolutely decide that. Here, I would like to point out, uh, there were three prior drug selling crimes, and the court balanced the probative versus prejudicial nature and determined that only one of those but crimes But it sounds like you're admissible. arguing you, th that that information must always come in, because otherwise you're not able to present no, Your Honor, your and case I, to respond to the defense. I do want to make that clear. I, I think we're talking in, in sort of broad terms here, but th we're just essentially talking about whether or not it's admissible, whether or not the balancing should occur. We're not saying it should automatically be admitted in every case. If there are no further questions. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Mollison? Just quickly, Your Honors. Um, as to whether or not this court has previously decided a case like this, I think it's very clear that this court has never been presented with a question um, like the one we have before us today, which is where the defendant has not affirmatively furthered that agency defense. And again, the appellate division was very clear that all of the evidence that supported agency in this case came directly well, the from the really people's case. the question really isn't whether the defendant affirmatively asserted the defense. The question is, is what, what is required in order to do that? Is asking for the charge enough? And uh, although here I think that, that there's at least arguably more than just asking for the charge because there's, there, as I indicated earlier, I think some suggestion in summation and cross-examination and so forth that, that that was something that was more than just passively accepted. Well, respectfully, Your Honor, I mean, again, just going over those questions that came up in cross-examination, they were so basic that if we were to say that we can't even ask those basic questions about a case, a case where the defendant presumably may have been an agent, I thought the, the people defendant asserted no right that there was a statement from counsel at opening or before opening that this looked like a case that involved agency. There, there was, and counsel said, I'm not sure, I haven't seen the grand jury testimony, or perhaps there was none, and so I'm going to wait to see what the prosecution presents. And then it turns out the prosecution presented an agency case far stronger than he would have even imagined. In, indeed, the, the police officer testified that he saw the defendant, Mr. Valentin, and his friend in the neighborhood, and he thought that they were buyers. Counsel, in that circumstance that you posited that the court might sui sponte determine from the evidence that comes in that an agency defense is warranted, whether or not the defendant is asking for it, uh, would the court then also be able to, under Molyneux, say, well, well, but I'm going to allow the people to rebut it? I think that I think that's exactly the rule that the prosecution's um, the, prosecu the what the rule the prosecution would ask this court to adopt is that when its own case is weak enough to to support an agency defense or an agency theory or, or require that the jury is instructed on an agency, um, essentially its priors will the defendant's I mean, priors will I come in. I guess my if they question come. is slightly different. Would it be error for the court to say I'm going to allow? this uh, evidence of a prior conviction under Molyneux because I'm balancing this. I'm allowing agency. I see that is, is there. And I'm also going to allow a Molyneux question. I think, I think that it would be error under the same discretionary principle, which is that this Molyneux evidence is far too prejudicial, especially in the case where the defendant has done nothing to, to probe that intent, to probe that intent question, and has simply relied on the weaknesses of the prosecution's case. And just finally, as to Judge Stein's um, question regarding um, is the charge enough, I do think that Gonzalez answers that question for us. I think that Gonzalez tells us that asking for a charge that is relying only on the the people's case in chief to ask for a charge simply does not uh, provide the prosecution a right to rebut its own case to shore up the weaknesses in its own case. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Honors.